Everybody, I said, praise the Lord. We're going to sing together from Gospel Hymns and Songs, number 216. Gospel Hymns and Songs, 216. More about Jesus, what I know. More of His grace to others show. More of His saving fullness see. More of His love who died for me. Don't worry to play for us well or sing and take it from here. La 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 more of his love who died for me more more about Jesus everybody more more about Jesus more of his saving fullness more of his love who died for me stands the one I know more of his grace to all the show, more of his saving fullness, more of his love who died for me, more, more about Jesus. More, more about Jesus, more of his saving fullness, more of his love who died for me. More about Jesus, let me learn. His holy will discern, Spirit of God, my teacher be, showing the things of Christ to me.
Amen. Everybody praise the Lord. Happy to be in your midst tonight for a Bible study. And I pray that the Bible study tonight will enrich every life in Jesus' name. I will benefit. The Bible study will profit me. It will profit you in Jesus' name. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you tonight and bless your name. We thank you for the Bible study. And we know you are going to enrich every life in the study tonight in Jesus' name. We're asking Lord tonight that you crucify self and cancel self and destroy self in everyone in Jesus' name. The attitude that says all of me and none of you, cancel it in our lives in Jesus' name. And the one that whispers more of me and less of you, cancel it in Jesus' name. Even the one that says less of me and more of you, cancel it in Jesus' name. May every heart come to you tonight with total surrender and full surrender. Whether we're members of the church or ministers, whether we're singers in the choir or any worker, we're asking Lord tonight, it will be all of you and none of us in Jesus' name. The pride that wants to compete with you, the pride that wants to do something you know, in such a way that there will be more of us and less of you cancel it in every life in Jesus' name. Wake us up to the glory of Christ. Wake us up to the goodness of Christ and wake us up to the totality and the fullness of Christ in every life in Jesus' name. Trample self under every feet and exalt Christ in every life. We well, thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. And somebody there shout. Amen. Thank you. You can sit down. I took uh, the congregational song because the choir didn't uh, really give their best. They manifested too much of self. And he put down Christ. And he didn't glorify Christ. That's why we have to sing more of Jesus, what I know. There will be more of Jesus in our lives in Jesus' name. Give me a good day. amen. We're coming to Mark tonight, chapter 9. And I'm reading from verse 30. Mark, chapter 9. We're reading from verse 30. And he departed this. And passed through Galilee. And he would not that any man should know it. For he taught his disciples and said unto them, The Son of Man is delivered into the hands of men, and they shall kill him. And after that is killed, he shall rise the third day. In verse 32. But they understood not that same, and were afraid to ask him. Verse 33, And he came to Capernaum, and being in the house, he asked them, What is it that she disp disputed about yourselves, among yourselves, by the way? But they held their peace. For by the way they are disputed among themselves, who would be the greatest. Now you think about that. The Lord Jesus Christ has been talking to them about his death, about his crucifixion. And that he's going to die, he's going to be killed, he'll be buried, on the third day he will rise again. They didn't think about the betrayal. They didn't think about the killing. They didn't think about the death. They didn't think about the burial. They didn't think about the resurrection. They didn't think about anything concerning Christ. All that concerns them was about themselves. And they disputed among themselves by the way. Who should be the greatest? Verse 35. And he sat down and called the twelve and says unto them, if any man desire to be first, 
If any man desires to be great, to be the greatest, the same shall be last of all, the least of all, and servant of all. And he took a child and set him in the midst of them. And when he had taken him in his arms, he said unto them, Whosoever shall receive one of such children in my name receiveth me and whosoever shall receive me receiveth not me but him that sent me and john answered him saying master we saw one casting out devils in thy name and he followeth not us and we forbade him we stopped him we told him, you cannot do that. We are the only people that can use the name of Jesus to cast out devils. So don't do that again. Because he followeth not us. Verse 39. But Jesus said, forbid him not. Forbid him not. Don't stop him. But there is no man which shall do a miracle in my name that can lightly speak evil of me. For he that is not against us is on our part. For whosoever shall give a cup of water to drink in my name, because he belong to Christ, verily I say unto you, he shall not lose his reward. I will not lose my reward. I said I will not lose my reward. As I've read the passage to you, the passage is divided clearly and cleanly into three parts. The first part talks about how Jesus taught and instructed his own disciples. And he told them and he showed them what was going to happen to him and what was going to be the final result of that. And the glory that will come. The resurrection that will come, the power of God that will be manifested after he rose from the dead. And then the second part talking about how they argued among themselves in the way. Who is higher? Who is greater? Who is the first? Who is the number one? Who should be recognized most? And then he asked them, what are you talking about? What are you discussing in the way? See what I just told you, and that has not entered your heart, and you're talking about your own little self becoming great and becoming number one, then instructed them. And then in the latter part, John came and said, Lord Jesus, you know, all this that we're talking, as we're coming, I saw somebody and was casting out devils in your name. I looked at him, yes, it was all right, he was effective. And he cast out the devil, and he used your name. He didn't even mention his own name. But the point is, he's not one of the twelve. And because he's not one of the twelve, we have to stop him. We forbid, we forbid him. And Jesus said, forbid him not. I told you before that the harvest is great. And the laborers are few. You twelve are not enough. And so if we have one there, one there, and one there, casting out devils in my name, exalting my name, and preaching my name to the people, I need all the people I can get. So don't stop him. Forbid him not. Those are the things we're looking at today. The subject we're looking at tonight is Christ's Perpetual instruction for heavenward pilgrims. Christ's perpetual instruction for heavenward pilgrims. We're strangers and pilgrims in this world. We're heavenly citizens and we're on our way to heaven. And He wants us to concentrate every time on that goal, on that journey, on that destination, on the place we're going. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go 
and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, so that where I am, there you will be also. That must be ringing the bell in every heart at every time, whatever the situation and whatever we're going through and whatever the people are going through, we understand, we're strangers and pilgrims and in this world we're going heavenward. And now we need to listen to the instruction, perpetual instruction. The constant instruction, the timeless instruction, the instruction that Jesus gave his disciples at that time and the instruction that Jesus is still giving to his disciples today. I pray you'll be a real disciple, a true disciple, a transformed disciple. I can't hear your voice. And that you'll be on your way to heaven in Jesus' name. Three things we're looking at that study tonight. Number one, the costly ignorance of his steadfast followers. These disciples were the followers of Christ. They were steadfast. They were committed. They didn't go here and there. They followed him from the moment they gave their lives to the Lord Jesus Christ. Consistently and constantly, they were following and yet, even though they were persistent in following, even though they were consistent in following, even though they were steadfast in following, even though they were committed, totally committed, without looking back and were following Jesus Christ, they had costly ignorance. Ignorance that will cost them their very life and will cost them their destiny. Number one, the costly ignorance of his steadfast followers. Number two, the constant increase of self-forgetting faithfulness. Faithfulness, yes, but the kind of faithfulness that makes you forget yourself. And every day and every moment, you're not comparing yourself with Christ. You're not seeking a position higher than that of Christ. And you're not aiming at any goal that will put you as number one and Jesus as number two. You forget yourself. You forget your joy. You forget your happiness. You forget whatever you were aiming at before you came to the Lord. And the kind of faithfulness the Lord requires from you and from me is a self-forgetting faithfulness. And those are the people that will increase. Those are the people that will progress. Those are the people that will be promoted. Those are the people that will be higher and deeper and they will go forth in the Lord. The constant increase of self-forgetting faithfulness. Point number three, the carnal imposition of self-seeking forbiddance. Forbid, then now is forbiddance self-seeking, forbidding other people. It's all mine. I'm the one to be there all the time. If I don't do it, nobody else can do it. And even though we're not able to finish everything, that's all right. Let those who are perishing perish. Let those who are being tormented keep on being tormented. But we must be the people and only the people that do it. And so we saw somebody casting out devils. And I looked at him, I looked at his face, and I saw that he followeth not us. And without even asking you, Lord Jesus Christ, I used my authority and I imposed a ban on him. And I said, don't you ever use that name of Jesus anymore. I forbade him. And Jesus said, how could you do that? The nine of you, when I came from the Mount of Transfiguration, tried and prayed and cried and pushed and pulled, and you couldn't heal that boy. And now you find somebody who is successful, somebody who is making it and somebody who is casting out devils in my name and you forbid him don't do that anymore i pray will you be obedient to the lord in jesus name 
the carnal imposition of self-seeking obedience. Those are the three points. We're coming to point number one. As I told you tonight, the total message itself is Christ's perpetual instruction for heavenward pilgrims. Christ's perpetual instruction for heavenward pilgrims. Point number one, the costly ignorance of his steadfast followers. We're coming to Mark chapter 9, and I'm reading from verse 30 to verse 32. Mark chapter 9, verses 30 to 32. And they departed this, and passed through Galilee. And he would know that any man should know it. He didn't want them like a mob to stampede him, to mob him, and to push him down. So he said, don't tell anyone, we're going to the next station, the start one. For he taught his disciples and said unto them, the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of men. And they shall kill him, and after that he is killed, he shall rise the third day. But they understood not that saying. They were ignorant of the necessity of his death. They were ignorant of the purpose of his coming the first time into the world. They were ignorant, even though he had told them a number of times before. And it says they understood not that saying. What saying? I just read it to you from verse 31. How he'll be betrayed, how he'll be killed, how he will be buried, and the third day he will rise from the dead. And it says, and they were afraid to ask him. They were afraid to ask him. This was the most important thing they ought to know. And this was the reason why Christ came into this world and was revealing that to them the necessity of his death, the salvation we have through his death, and the victory he will have when he rises up the third day. They need to understand. And they wouldn't ask. They asked him other questions of less importance. They asked him other questions that were temporary. But this question about his death, about his burial, and about his resurrection, something of eternal value for the whole world in all generations of men and women, they didn't understand and they didn't ask. This wasn't the first time we would tell them. Come to Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8. And I'm reading from verse 31. Mark chapter 8 verse 31. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things. Must. Because that had been decided from all eternity. It was the will of the Father. It was the only way to get us saved. It was the only way to ha make us have eternal life. And he told them he must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and of the chief priests and scribes and be killed and after three days will rise again. And I was thinking just about the death. That's what they're going to understand. They wouldn't even think about his resurrection that will give us justification, that will give us forgiveness, that will give us salvation, that will give us eternal life. They will not even think about that. All they were thinking about, I don't understand this. How does he say he will die? How does he say they will kill him? How does he say he'll be buried? And then on the third day he'll rise again. Do you understand John? Do you understand James? Do you understand Peter? Do you understand much? I don't understand. Let's ask him. No, I'm afraid. I don't want to ask him. Why would you be afraid of Jesus when you're saying the, the most important thing that you should understand? And then you will not ask. 
And sometimes that takes place, that happens in the church. The people that have genuine questions, they don't ask. The people that have real life transforming questions, they don't ask. The people that have questions that will bring solution to our lives and that will bring a growth to the church, the people they are afraid to ask is the people that don't have relevant, important questions that raise up their hands and they ask questions. And the question time then becomes like a ridicule. It becomes like we're playing church. I pray that things will turn around in Jesus name let the church say amen. amen that those of us that are really serious minded will want to get to heaven will want to walk in the narrow path that leads to heaven and we have challenges and we have problems and we have questions to ask that we will ask and those questions will be beneficial to everyone in Jesus name now, about the death of Jesus, what's that about? Why was he that Jesus was going to die on the cross of Calvary? And then that he will be raised up from the dead on the third day. We're looking at Matthew chapter 20. Matthew chapter 20, and I'm reading from verse 18. Matthew chapter 20, we're looking at verse 18. Behold, we go up to Jerusalem. And the Son of Man shall be betrayed into the, unto the chief priest and unto the scribes, and they shall condemn him to death. Look at that. Still saying the same thing. They didn't understand. He repeated it. And yet they still didn't understand. And they will not ask. When God repeats something over and over, when Christ repeats something over and over, when the scripture repeats something over and over, when the Spirit of God repeats something over and over, that thing must be mightily important. That thing must be highly important. And if you still don't understand, after many repetitions, it's good to ask. And when you ask, a final solution will come. I said a final solution will come. The amen tonight is door. You know, I have uh, discovered in the church that when your pastor is like sugar daddy, even when you put something down which you should put up, you throw it out which you should bring in, and then your daddy speaks to you and says, that thing you throw out, bring it back. That's not right. I see that the church then becomes cold. Your pastor will not be a sugar daddy. Yeah. When things go wrong, we have to correct it. If you go wrong, I have to correct it. Give me a good amen. Yeah. And so if the cause of correction, I say, this is not right, it's deeper life, make it deeper, make it higher, make it richer, make it holier, make it brighter, and let deeper life be deeper life. If I say that, that's my responsibility. And it's like contending for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. And when you are corrected, that's not the time to be cold. So throw away the coldness, let fervency come back to you. Yeah. We're looking at uh, Matthew chapter 20, and I'm reading now from verse 19. And shall, and shall deliver him to the Gentiles to mock and to scourge and to crucify him, and the third day he shall rise again. But why? Why the death? Why the crucifixion? And why the resurrection? Look at verse 28. Verse 28, Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. That's why he came, to give his life a ransom for many. It's to change lives, it's to save lives, it's to cleanse lives, it's to bring us out of darkness and to bring us into the light. If you are not in the light yet, you'll come to the light in Jesus' name. I'm coming to Luke chapter 9. You will see that this death of Jesus is repeated over and over. 
but his followers, steadfast followers, those who are born again, those who are children of God, they left everything behind and they were following the Lord. And the very reason why he said, come after me, and they were following him, he began to reveal to them now, and they didn't understand, and they wouldn't ask the costly ignorance of his steadfast followers. We're looking at Luke chapter 9, verse 44. Luke chapter 9, I'm reading from verse 44. Let these sayings sink down into your ears. He even said, I'm going to tell you something now. And don't allow it to be on the surface of your heart, superficial. I'm going to tell, reveal something to you now. Don't allow it to come in one ear and go out the other ear. Let this sin sink deep into your ears. What was that? For the Son of Man shall be delivered into the hands of men. The Son of Man, the Son of God, the Savior, the Lord, the Master, the Healer, the Deliverer, the one who has been go going about and doing good, healing all that was oppressed of the devil, is going to be arrested and is going to be delivered into the hands of wicked men. Verse 45, but they understood not the same, and it was hid from them that they perceived it not. And they feared to ask him of that sin. They knew that it was an important sin because he said, Let it sink deep into your heart. And yet, as important as it was, they didn't understand and they didn't ask. That's why we call it the costly ignorance. We will not be like that. I will not be like that. Whatever we don't understand, we ask, especially something relating to our salvation, something relating to the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, something relating to our sanctification, something relating to our getting to heaven, we will not be ignorant. In Luke chapter 18, Luke chapter 18, I'm reading from verse 31. Luke chapter 18, we're reading from verse 31. Then he took unto him the twelve, and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished. He was telling them, it's not something that is an afterthought. God had thought about it. God had revealed it and the prophets of the old testament they have spoken about it actually from the beginning of the bible god himself had mentioned that this will happen you can even go before the beginning from the foundation before the foundation of the world it had been uh, uh, underlined and it had been spoken out and the father had spoken to the son that he will die for the sins of humanity that you find in revelation chapter 13 verse 8 and also in other chapters of revelation that christ before the foundation of the world will be slain and then at the time of the fall it was revealed and so jesus now said in chapter 18 of luke verse 31 and he took unto him the twelve and said unto them behold we go off into to jerusalem and all things that are written by the prophets concerning the son of man shall be accomplished and that's why we know to you, you're a Christian, you're a believer. All things that are written concerning you shall be accomplished. Yeah. Nothing you know, will happen by accident. Yeah. And nothing will take you by surprise. Whatever happens, God knows all things. He says, He knows my down sitting, He knows my standing up, He knows my thoughts afar off, He knows everything that will happen. And whatever happens to you today, whatever happens to you tomorrow, all things have been foreknown by the Almighty God. And as I said, those things are already foreknown, the way to escape. And the way to have the victory, the Lord has also ordained that you will discover it in Jesus' name. 
But you know, when something happens and you are jolted, when something happens and you're fret, when something happens and you're worried, when something happens and you're anxious, when something happens and then you're wondering and you're saying, why should this happen to me? Why should this happen to me? You will not see the way of escape out of that problem. But if you understand that all things work together, tell me, for good to those who are the called of God and to those who are walking according to his purpose and as it happened to Christ that all things that were written all things that had been earmarked that will happen all those things happen and you are not surprised they are just been accomplished according to what the Father has ordained you are going to get through you are going to move on and nothing will jolt you or surprise you or disorganize your life in Jesus' name. Look at verse 32, what he said at the reaching, which is going to be accomplished. For he shall be delivered unto the Gentiles and shall be mocked and, and, and spitefully entreated and spitted on. And they shall scourge him. He knew that this was going to happen. That's why he opened not his mouth. That's why he took it patiently. That's why he relaxed when all those things happened and put him to death. But you see, he never spoke about the death without talking about the outcome. Never talk about your suffering without talking about the solution. If there is any suffering, you know, a solution is going to come. I said the solution is going to come. Yes. And you have heard about this coming retreat. What's the theme for that retreat? Ah, uh, can't hear your voice very well. Jesus, the final solution. Look up at me here. I see solution coming your way. Final solution. Full solution, perfect solution, permanent solution. Christ will be the final solution in your life in this coming retreat in Jesus' name. I will be there. I said, I will be there. Look at verse 34. And they understood none of these things. Think about that, Peter. John, James, they had been to the Mount of Transfiguration, they had seen Moses, they had seen Elijah, discussing with Jesus about his departure, and yet it says all of them did not understand. Of course, Judas was there, he didn't understand, I will not be in the same class with Judas Iscariot. I said I will not be in the same class with Judas Iscariot. He will never understand, but I will understand. Look at verse 34. And they understood none of these things. And the saying was hid from them. Neither knew they the things which were spoken. They didn't know. But thank God you will know. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 3. Acts, chapter 3. And I'm reading here from verse 13. Acts, chapter 3. And we're reading from verse 13. It says in Acts, chapter 3, verse 13, The God of Abraham, and of Isaac, and of Jacob, and the God of our fathers, have glorified his son Jesus, whom he delivered up. And deny whom ye delivered up and denied him in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. But he denied the Holy One and the just and desired a murderer to be granted unto you and killed the prince of life whom God has raised from the dead. Always remember resurrection always followed his death and always remember solution will always follow the problem in your life whereof we are witnesses look at this and his name through faith in his name 
has made this man strong, whom ye see and know, yea, the faith which is by which is by him has given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. Now Peter realized the death of Christ was not in vain. The resurrection of Christ was not in vain. It is through faith in his name, the name of the one who died for us to redeem us from every curse, and the name of the one who rose from the dead. It is through that faith in the name that has given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. But look at verse 17, a very significant. And now, brethren, and now, Israelites, and now you who crucified him and slew him and you killed him and now brethren my countrymen i know i watch that through ignorance he did it as did also your rulers he said to them i know you did it by ignorance as Peter himself was ignorant before, and the disciples were ignorant before, he knew that all those Jewish people that killed the Lord Jesus Christ, they did it by ignorance, because of their ignorance. And I pray that we will not be ignorant as they were in Jesus' name. We we'll value the death of Jesus. We we'll value the resurrection of Jesus will value the redemption of Jesus and we will uphold everything Jesus died to give unto us in Jesus name. Yeah. Romans chapter 10 I'm reading from verse 3. Romans chapter 10 verse 3. For they have been ignorant of God's righteousness. You see that? Those Jewish people were ignorant of God's righteousness that only through the days of Christ, only through the burial of Christ, only through the resurrection of Christ will that righteousness come. They were ignorant. And even the disciples too, they were ignorant. They didn't understand that righteousness, that restoration, that redemption, that our reconciliation with God can only take place and can only happen through the resurrect the death and resurrection of Christ and that it was necessary that he will die. It was necessary that he will be raised again. And all the nation of the Jewish people, they had that same ignorance. That ignorance now has been taken away from our hearts. It's been taken away from my heart. And now I know, and now you know, that if anyone is going to get saved, it is because Jesus died, it's because Jesus rose again, that that uh, salvation will come. Look at uh, verse 9, verse 9 of that same chapter 10 of Romans, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead. That's the secret of salvation. And that is the revelation of how we get salvation that you believe in your heart. That God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. They were ignorant of the necessity of his death, you will not be ignorant. And as the one who has not got salvation, as you are hearing that today, and you say, yes, Lord, I'm going to concentrate on that. I believe that you died for me. I believe you rose again for my justification. Salvation will come to you. Eternal life will come to everyone. And it is only through that grace that brings, that brought salvation to us, that same grace will keep us in the salvation in Jesus' name. We're coming now to point number two, the constant increase of self-forgetting faithfulness. If you are faithful to the Lord, that faithfulness comes to an acceptable level in the sight of God when you forget yourself. You forget about who you are. You forget about your happiness. You forget about your joy. You forget about what you like, what you want, what you desire. And you're only thinking about him. Self 
forgetting faithfulness and you do that everywhere in your home you forget yourself you watch the upliftment of your partner of your spouse of your wife your husband of your children of your parents in the office at work you forget yourself you want the joy the happiness of the next person when you are in the taxi you are the boss anywhere you are you forget about your own convenience and comfort you want the convenience and the comfort of the other person everywhere you go you let self die everywhere you go that bitter shame of saying it's all of me and none of him and none of others you let that die and all the wishful thinking of okay less of me and less of Christ and less of others you let all that die and you come to that realization that now it is none of me and all of him and you put others first that's how you are going to increase you will increase in Jesus name look at Mark chapter 9 I'm reading from verse 33 Mark chapter 9 verse 33 and he came to Capernaum and being in the house he asked them his disciples what was it that thou disputed that ye disputed among yourselves by the way but he held their peace they kept quiet they kept mute they won't say anything it was dawning on them now they were not being ashamed of such dispute of such discourse they were now ashamed of such conversation of that dispute and questioning between themselves they held their peace for by the way they had disputed among themselves who should be the greatest and he sat down and he called the twelve and he says unto them if any man desire to be forced the same shall be last of all and servant of all what causes dispute conflict fighting between husband and wife is the argument i am the head you must submit is the argument uh-huh you are the head but i'm more educated than you are therefore you must listen to me that's what brings dispute what brings dispute between two ministers he is a preacher he is a preacher and then the dispute is see the way you are handling church work you think you are very important if i am not there you will not be significant so we we'll see now you see it is that argument of who will be the greatest that is what brings dispute as we go to our places of work at work what brings dispute what brings a conflict and what brings a fighting it is like you know those people they sit up there and they think that they are very important and i am a porter here and i am a low level employee here but they don't understand if i don't clean the toilet if i don't open the gate and if i don't uh, do the porter's work very well they will not have anything to do if i don't give them all that they will need to make the office work easy for them what can they do is the argument I'm important and you must recognize my importance it is the argument if I'm not there nothing good will happen we we'll forget that with God all things are possible we we'll forget that none of us can stop God we we'll forget that none of us can downgrade and demote Christ and say if I'm not there salvation will not come to humanity it is that exaggeration of our position 
It is that exaggeration of our personality. It is that exaggeration of our talent, of our gift, that we think we're more important than the others. That's what brings the pride, and that's what brings the conflict. That's what brings the dispute. I pray that dispute will no more be in our midst in Jesus' name. Give me a good amen. Look at verse 36. It says in verse 36, And he took a child and set him in the midst of them. And when he had taken him in his arms, he said unto them, Whosoever shall receive one of such children in my name, receiveth me. And whosoever shall receive me, receiveth not just me, but him that sent me. He wants us all to be humble. We'll be humble in Jesus' name. What have we got that we have not received? And before we came to this world, God had been doing his own will and he continues to do his own will and after we are gone if jesus tarries god will still continue and god will not lack any hand he will not lack any skill he will not lack any minister what he will do he will do have you ever thought about it before i was born the Bible was already printed. Before I was born, there was a man called Martin Luther. Before I was born, there was a man called John Wesley. Before I was born, all those great people of God have come in their generation and they have done the work of God. And many people have been saved. And after I'm gone, and after you are gone, the work of God will still continue. He wants us to be humble. And he wants us to be lowly minded so that pride will not destroy our lives in Jesus' name. We're coming to Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18, I'm reading from verse 1. In Matthew chapter 18, reading here from verse 1, and the same time came the disciples unto Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus called a little child unto him, and set him in the midst of them, and said, Verily I say unto you, Except ye be converted. He's talking to his disciples, he's talking to Peter, he's talking to John, he's talking to James, he's talking to you, he's talking to me, he's talking to every member of the church. He's talking to every worker in the church, volunteer workers and full-time workers. He's talking to every minister, every overseer. And he says in verse 3, and he said, Verily I say unto you, except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. And whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. I pray that this path of becoming great in the kingdom of God, the Lord will allow you, allow me, and empower you, empower me to take that path of lowliness and that path of humility in Jesus' name. In Luke chapter 22, Luke chapter 22, I'm reading from verse 24. Luke chapter 22, and we're reading from verse 24. And there was also a strife among them. You would have thought after we were saved, no more strife, no more fighting, no more violence. There will be no more violence in our midst in Jesus' name. But you know, if I am jealous of what you have, and you are jealous of what I have, there will be strife, there will be violence. If I want to control you, and you want to control me, we will be fighting for who is going to have the upper hand. If you want to have your way, and I have to want, I want to have my way, there will be fighting. We will not fight. I said we will not fight. Are you there? You will not fight in Jesus' name. 
It says in verse 24, and there was also a strife, a fight, argument among them. Which of them should be accounted the greatest? And then he goes on in verse 25, and he said unto them, The kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and they that execute or exercise authority, that's it, exercise authority. Those who like to be authoritative. And those who like to control and command, and those who like to say, if you don't obey me, your life's goal will be shattered. You can only succeed if you obey me. Those who like that kind of authority, and they like to impose their big power and their big self on other people, they be like the world. And when it says we shouldn't love the world or love the things in the world, that's exactly what he was talking about. It's in the world they have that kind of strife. In the world they have that kind of violence. In the world they have that kind of argument. And it says in the midst of the children of God, it will not be so. I said it will not be so. Why don't we have peace in our families? With all that we're learning, with all the scripture we're reading, why is there no gentleness and meekness and love in the family? It is this exercising of authority. The wife also wants to prove if you think you are the husband, you are the man, you are the head, and you want to assess authority, I'll show you. And it is when the man wants to show the woman, the woman wants to show the man, there's no peace in the family. There will be peace in your family. Yeah. The prince of peace will reign in your family. Yeah. And in the family of God, in the church, the prince of peace will reign in Jesus' name. Yeah. It says in the world among the Gentiles, they exercise authority upon themselves and they're called benefactors. In verse 26, but ye shall not be so. But he that is greatest among you, let him be as the younger, and he that is chief as he that does serve. And then in verse 27, for whether, whether is greater, he that sitteth at meat, or he that serveth, is it not, is not he that sitteth at meat, but, read it with me, one, two, three, go. Read it well. Read it as if you are happy to be at the Bible study tonight. But I am among you. That's Christ. That's the Lord. That's the Master. That's the Savior. That's the Redeemer. He came to show us the way. And those who are true sons of God, they will follow Christ. I'm a true child of God. I will follow Christ. Fighting will not start from me. Strife will not start from me. Imposing authority will not start from me. Gentleness and meekness and love. That's what he wants. And he says, because of that, I am among you as he that serveth. You focus on your service and then there'll be no strife. You focus on your service. You want to be of tremendous benefit to the next man, to the next woman. You want to be of tremendous benefit to all the members and to all the ministers and to everyone. Peace will reign through you, through me, and through us in Jesus' name. Look at Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. We're reading here from verse 3. Philippians chapter 2. And we're reading from verse 3. Let nothing be done through strife of inglory. You see that? 
everything we do in our personal lives, in our families, in our offices, on the road, in a taxi, in the bus, you are not going to be the one that has been glory, pride. You don't know who I am. You don't know where I'm coming from. I'm not an illiterate like you. You are just a bus conductor. I am so and so, and I will show you. I will show you I don't only have education, I have training, and I have long leg, and I have contacts, and you will suffer for what you've done. Uh -uh. What's about that? It says, anywhere we are, let nothing be done through strife or being glory. The same thing in the church. Nothing. Whether we're singing or we're ushering or any other work we're doing, let nothing, anything we do, do it to benefit the church. Do it to uphold righteousness. Do it to manifest love and spread the love of God everywhere. Let there be no service. Let there be no time when you do something out of strife and being glory. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Verse 4, look not every man on his own things. But every man on the things of others, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Did Jesus do anything by pride? Did he do anything by retaliation? Okay, he behaved like that yesterday. We are going to throw the stone to him today. Jesus never did that. If we're pilgrims going to heaven, and if we're citizens of heaven, if we want to get to heaven, and we're not just religious people, we must have the mind of Christ, and we must have the heart of Christ, and we must have the spirit of Christ, doing nothing by strife of being glory. That will be cancelled in our lives. Cancelled in your life. Look at Philippians chapter 2, and I'm reading from verse 25. Philippians chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 25. Yet I suppose it necessary to say to you, Epaphroditus, my brother and companion in labor, and fellow soldier, but your messenger, and he that ministered, to my wants. Look at verse 13. Because for the work of Christ, he was nigh unto death. Look at this man. He so committed himself, he so gave himself, and he so sacrificed himself, he forgot about himself. That's what we're saying. We should render self forgetting service. You forget yourself. And we're told about this man. He was nice unto death. Look at this. Not regarding his own life. Not regarding his own life. To supply your lack of service toward me. I pray that that same mind of Christ, spirit of Christ, humility of Christ, meekness of Christ, he will give unto us. And when that is given unto us, it will be seen very clearly. There will be no argument between the disciples anymore. There will be no strife between the disciples anymore. Who is greater? Who is higher? Who is number one? Who is the most important? Who is the person that if it's not there, nothing will go at all? All that argument will go. And we will help each other to be our best in the work of God, in the kingdom of God. I'm looking at Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. And I'm reading from verse 24. Acts chapter 20 verse 24. But none of these things move me. Paul the apostle said, I don't worry about who is great, who is small, who is high, who is low. 
I don't worry about who is respected, who is not respected. I'm not worried about who is honored or who is, uh, you know, despised. I'm not worried about that, he says. But none of these things move me. Persecution. None of these things move me. Misunderstanding. None of these things move me. Misrepresentation. None of these things move me. Whatever the service demands and whatever we have to go through, he says for himself, none of these things move me. You know, for some people, simple traffic jam will disturb them. Simple hold up on the road will disturb them. And simple correction will destabilize them. But Paul the Apostle said, you know what? I've taken reputation, I've thrown that away. I've taken the desire to be high and the desire to control other people, I've thrown that away. None of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my cause for joy. You'll finish with joy. You'll finish well. You will not stop your journey halfway in Jesus' name. Paul the Apostle counted his um, ministry very important. He counted the opportunity to serve very important. And so he said, whatever happens in the ministry doesn't bother me at all. So that I can finish my cause with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord to testify of the gospel of the grace of God. I pray that same heart you will have. All right, that same heart I will have. Look at First Corinthians chapter thirteen. First Corinthians chapter thirteen. I'm reading here from verse one. First Corinthians chapter thirteen, verse one. It says, "Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, and have not love, that what charity there is love, and have not love, I am become as a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal." You see, if we don't have love to the people we are ministering to, and all we want to have is to be number one, to be the first, it's not acceptable to God. In verse 2, and though I have the gift of prophecy, and understand all mysteries, and all knowledge, and though I have faith, all faith, so that I could remove mountains, and have not love, I am nothing. Look at verse 3. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burnt, and have not charity, have not love, it profited me nothing. What charity is he talking about? What love is he talking about? Look at verse 4. Charity love suffereth long and is kind. Charity suffereth long and is kind. That's why in the family, in real Christian family, there's no di divorce and remarriage. Whatever you are going through in that family, suffereth longer and is kind. As a man, you're still giving all that is necessary for the family. And you're working, you're sweating, and you're sacrificially doing everything that needs to be done. Even if you feel they don't appreciate me, they don't do this, and my wife is like that, and my children are like this, and the in-laws are like this and like that. Charity, love, suffers long, and is kind. You'll be kind to your wife. Women, you'll be kind to your husband. I want a good amen. You know, we need to study the Bible in a practical way so that we're not just dishing out verses and verses and verses, theory, which does nobody any good. That's why we're making the application. Charity is so long and it's kind. Charity envies not. Charity envies not. Envy brings strife. Envy brings jealousy, and jealousy brings strife and violence. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not popped up. Look at this, verse 5, does not behave itself unseemly. Look at what follows, seeketh not her own. Seeketh not her own. I must have the upper hand, uh-uh, seeketh not her own. 
when there is love, when there is charity, you're not seeking your own so that you have the upper hand. That's what brought strife and bring glory between those disciples. And he said, charity contest not itself, is not puffed up. No pride anymore in Jesus' name. In my heart, in my life, in my ministry, in my action, no more strive. Thank God. I said, Praise the Lord. There will be no more strife in our midst in Jesus' name. Point number three now the carnal imposition of self seeking forbidding of others. Forbidding of others. Look at Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9. I'm reading from verse 38. Mark chapter 9, verse 38. And John answered him, saying, You remember, if you know what we're called, in what we normally refer to one, and we say, John is the apostle of love. John did not remain what were in the way we're reading now. A change came. A transformation came. In our lives, a change will come. Look at what he was. And then look at what he became. He became an apostle of love. It says, and John answered him, saying, Master, we saw one casting out devils in thy name, and he followeth not us, and we forbade him, because he followeth not us. And Jesus said, Forbid him not, for there is no man which shall do a miracle in my name that can lightly speak evil of me. For he that is not against us is on our part. For whosoever shall give you a cup of water in my name, because she belonged to Christ, verily I say unto you, he shall not lose his reward, or will not lose her reward. Let's look at Luke chapter 9. The same thing we have read in Mark, but as the reason we're reading this one from chapter 9. Luke chapter 9. I'm reading from verse 49. Luke chapter 9, verse 49. And John answered and said, Master, we saw one casting out devils in thy name. And we forbade him, we stopped him, because he followeth not us. And Jesus said unto him, somebody there tell me, say it well, say it with conviction, forbid him not, for he that is not against us is for us. As you read that, you are wondering, John, how could you do that? There are many people who are having problems. And we have not solved all the problems of the people. There were many people having oppression of demons, attack of demons, affliction of demons, and all of them were not delivered yet. How could you go ahead to stop somebody who is doing a necessary work? Look at chapter 9. I'm reading from verse 1. This is what had happened earlier. In Luke chapter 9, verse 1. Luke chapter 9, verse 1. And he called his 12 disciples together. And he gave them power and authority over all devils and to cure diseases. And he sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. This is the reason why John, looking at that man, who was not one of the twelve, said, We were the people that received the power and the authority. And he gave us the command, Go 
and deliver their prayers and cast out devils and heal the sick. And so later in the chapter, that's in verse 49 now, when he saw somebody who was not part of the people in chapter 9 verses 1 and 2. That's why he stopped him. But you know what? He didn't know the mind of Christ. He didn't know the program of Christ. He didn't know the intention of Christ. Go now to chapter 10. Chapter 10, I'm reading from verse 1. Chapter 10, verse 1. After these things, the Lord appointed other 70 also. John didn't know that. That the work will not stop at the doorstep of the 12 people and that the authority and the anointing and the power will not stop with the 12 that Jesus still had the intention he had the program he was still going to choose 70 other people and was going to give them the same power the same anointing and the same authority and they were going to manifest that and they were going to cast out devils and heal the sick. And because he was ignorant of the intention of Christ, that's why he saw only one person casting out devils and he forbade him. Look at that chapter 10 verse 1. After these things, the Lord appointed other 70 also and sent them two and two before his face or into every city and place whither he himself would come. Therefore said he unto them, The harvest truly is great. After the twelve in chapter nine had gone out and they had done express for Christ and they had preached repentance and they had healed the sick and they had cast out devils, Jesus said, the harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. The twelve are not enough. All of us who are, you know, doing the work now, yes, thank God of the, because of what we're doing. And thank God for the success we have in the children ministry, in the youth ministry, campus ministry, in the language section, in the women ministry, and in the pastoral ministry. Thank God for the work we're doing. But it says that the harvest truly is great and the laborers are few we're still few we're not enough that's why we cannot you know say you know go outside what are you doing there i forbid you i forbid you i forbid you we are the only people that can get the thing done and that is why you know there are some people when they have this uh, myopic understanding this little understanding this narrow-minded understanding they say oh, the pastor is making a mistake now what is he saying he wants anointing service and then he's anointing the people and he's saying I pass it across to you all those Tuesday workers and all those uh, Tuesday leaders and that the same power that works in me will work in you. Let our GS be our GS. Let our pastor be our pastor and hold on to that knowledge you have. Hold on to the anointing you have. Don't distribute anything to anybody. You know people can be proud and you know people can you know go astray and they say now I have anointing. I want to start my own ministry i want to start my own church therefore if you make a mistake of saying i pass the anointing on i hope you've done that last tuesday you'll never do that again i will do it again until the people of God have the power of God and the anointing of God and they're able to move out and they do the same thing. Look at Jesus. Jesus said, He that believes on me, the works I do, he shall do. If Jesus Christ is so humble, if Jesus Christ comes to a level and he says, I'm not going to be the only one, he that believes on me, the works I do, he shall do, and greater works than thee shall do deal because I go to the Father. Lord Jesus don't you think they'll be proud if they can do the work you're doing. Lord Jesus don't you think uh, pride will enter into them uh, if uh, they will do greater works than you have done. He says no because they realize it's by grace. They realize it is not in their hand. That's why as Peter in Acts of the Apostles chapter 3 as he confronted that man he says silver and gold by none in the name of Jesus Christ what I have I give unto you in the name of Jesus of Nazareth rise up and walk what happened 
he rose up and he walked. Because that same of faith and that same power not you have been given unto him. The fulfillment of the words of Jesus that the laborers are few. He will not be the only one doing it and the twelfth will not be the only one. And the seventy will come in and more will come in. That's why Peter in chapter 5 of Acts of the Apostles as they passed by, even the shadow of Peter healed the sick. That did not happen at the time of Jesus. Was Peter proud because of that? I say, was Peter proud because of that? If you're a real, steadfast child of God, holy child of God, and sanctified child of God, when you receive that power, that anointing, you will not be proud. You will know that it is for the work of the Lord. That's why we shouldn't forbid anybody. You know, they are going out and they are you're preaching the gospel to the, uh, to the sinners and they are healing the sick. We saw one casting out devils in your name and we forbade him. We will not forbid anymore. And in Jesus' name. And look at this, look at this. But still, therefore, said he unto them, The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore, the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. Look at verse 9, in verse 9, and heal the sick that are therein. And say unto them, the kingdom of God is come nice unto you. Look at verse 17. In verse 17, and the 70 returned again with joy. And the 70 returned again with joy. That's why I said last Tuesday, our Tuesday leaders, when we come for the Tuesday uh, leaders meeting tomorrow, we're going to come with joy. We're coming with excitement. We're coming with testimony. We're coming with triumph in the name of Jesus. And the seventy returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. John, you stopped only one person, and Jesus brought up seventy. Align your heart, align your mind with the mind of Christ. If you stopped one and Jesus raised up 70 to have the same power, the same anointing, you are different from Jesus, forbid him not. Verse 18, and he says unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Behold, tell me that. John, you are stopping only one person, but I'm raising up 70 people, not just one. And even though the 70 have gone out and they have been successful and triumphant, I'm going to give them greater power. I will not forbid anyone. You will not forbid anyone. Uh, you know, sometimes, and it is, I don't understand, uh, you know, the sanctification some people believe, you are a coordinator, the other person is women coordinator, and it's like, you know, the women coordinator is caged. And you cannot do everything. That's why the woman coordinator is there. Release all the people to do what God has appointed them for them to do. But I want to be the one that is recognized and the one that is known and the one that is the greatest in the district, in the group. Let all that go. Let humility come in our midst and let us serve the Lord without any inhibition and imposition of any self or boisterous person and we're going to do that in Jesus' name. I will be free to minister. I said I will be free to minister. I will not allow anybody to have any remote control to make me stop. I will not stop. I can't hear you. You will not stop in Jesus' name. 
And if you have been doing anything like that indirectly to forbid other people or to forbid the GS or to forbid the pastor and not allow him to have the freedom he ought to have, the Lord is telling you, forbid him not. Why are you doing that? And if you have been forbidding another person, stopping another person, using your personality to clamp down on them, Jesus said, stop it and forbid him, not forbid her not. Let everyone in the household of faith have the freedom and the liberty to serve the Lord. We will serve the Lord with liberty and without any fear in Jesus' name. Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Nothing shall by any means hurt you. Nothing shall by any means hurt you. It will be fulfilled in your life in Jesus' name. Look at thought John, thought John. I'm reading, it has only one chapter. Thought John. We're reading from verse 9. Thought John, reading from verse 9. It says in thought John, chapter 1, verse 9, I wrote unto the church, but do trephes, who loveth to have preeminence among them, receiveth us not. You see, that, that's the problem. Wanting to have preeminence, wanting to have high recognition, want to, wanting to be called the greatest, wanting to be known as the number one person, high and, high and taller than everybody. And I wrote unto the church, but Diotrephes, who loveth to have preeminence among them, receiveth us not. Wherefore, if I come, I will remember his deeds, which he doeth, prating against us, slandering us, talking against us, telling lies against us, Preaching against us apostles with malicious words and not content therewith, neither does he himself receive the brethren and uh, what's the next word? And what's the next word? Tell me out aloud. Forbidest them that would and casteth them out of the church instead of casting out devils it was casting out members instead of casting out devils it was casting out ministers it was discouraging the ministers and discouraging the faithful members of the church casting them out i'm the leader here i'm the authority here and whoever does not bow down to me here will not do anything here hey that's the work of christ in the church of god it's not your property. You only have a privilege. I only have a privilege to serve in the house of God. I pray that humility will be in our lives in Jesus' name. Amen. We're looking at Numbers chapter 11. Numbers chapter 11. In Numbers chapter 11, I'm reading from verse 25. Numbers 11. Verse 25, and the Lord came down in a cloud and spake unto him, that's unto Moses, and took of the spirit that was upon him and gave it unto the seventy elders. It is not the will of God that just one person will monopolize all the power of God. The power of the Spirit is for everyone. The promise is unto you and to children and to them that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. We must not only read it, we must believe it. And we must allow it to take effect in every life. 
And here it says, the Lord took of the Spirit and gave to the seventy elders. And it came to pass that when the Spirit rested upon them, they prophesied and did not cease. The Spirit of God will come upon you. You accept, it will be accomplished. Look at verse 26. And there remained two of the men in the camp. The name of the one elder and the name of the other Midas. And the Spirit rested upon them. The Spirit rested upon elder and Midas. And they were of them that were reaching. If your name is reaching in the book of life, this power will come upon your life. Yeah. The outpouring of the Spirit will be upon you in Jesus' name. They were reaching, but they went not out unto the tabernacle. And they prophesied in the camp. And there ran a young man and told Moses and said, Eldad, Amidad, do prophesy in the camp. Moses, Moses, leader, I come to make a report. You told them to come all to the tabernacle and that the gift of the Spirit will be poured upon all the seventy. There are two that didn't obey you fully and they were in the camp. And as the Spirit came upon the sixty eight in the camp, it came upon them too. I came to report that to you. See what you do. Verse 28, And Joshua, the son of Nun, servant of Moses, one of his young men, answered and said, What did he say? Say it now. Say it so you will not say it to anybody. My Lord Moses forbid them. Thank God this one, Joshua, he didn't go to stop them by himself like John did. He said, Moses, my Lord, forbid them. And Moses said unto him, Envious thou for my sake. Stop them. That comes out of envy. Arrest them. That comes out of envy. Discipline them. That comes out of envy. Tell them never to do that anymore. That comes out of envy. You know, when you are envious, when you are jealous, a lot of restriction and a lot of bylaws will be promulgated in your local district, in your local group, in your, in your, in your region, in your state. It will be like, you know, the laws in the Bible are not enough. And so you must bring up your own private law to clamp down on people. And this thou for my sake, would God, that all the Lord's people were prophets. Would God, that all the Lord's people were prophets, and that the Lord will put his spirit upon them, upon all the people. Actually, that's what God has now promised. And the promise is unto you. And the power is unto you. And the fulfillment is unto you. Yeah. And the Lord will accomplish it in your life, in our lives all together in Jesus' name. Yeah. Acts of the Apostles chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 8. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. But he shall receive power. After that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and in Samaria, and to the uttermost part of the earth. Verse 39 of chapter 2. Chapter 2, verse 39. For the promise is unto you, and to your children, and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Don't forbid anyone. Let's have all the benefits of what Christ did and produced on the cross of Calvary. 
and all things about his death that he has revealed to us anything you don't understand and you're a genuine bona fide child of God ask don't be afraid to ask and the answer that will bring final solution in your life will come to you in Jesus name and remember forget yourself forget yourself you have only one life to live and if you are selfish thinking about yourself and planning for yourself and uh, bulldozing your way through and you are proud you will not get everything the Lord has said uh, 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 for you that you will get but constant increase will come when you forget yourself and you are faithful to the Lord and when you see other people and they manifest power they manifest happiness and joy and they're doing the work of God without any hindrance and without any discouragement or without any going back rejoice with them and know that they're fulfilling the promise of the Lord that he shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you and he tells us that because we are the children of God and we will believe the Lord these signs shall follow them that believe in my name they will cast out devils it will happen to you I said it will happen to you. This sign shall follow them that believe in my name. They will cast out devils and will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents and throw them away. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. Poison will not kill you. And they shall lay their hands on the sick and they shall recover. Who are those people? I said who are those people? Put down your hands, put down your hands, you know. If I told you there is a million uh, naira waiting for somebody and who wants to catch it and have it, your hand will go up straight very well. And I said that you are going to expand the power of God and the power of the Holy Ghost and you will cast out devils and you will heal the sea and great mighty exploits will be done through you. Who are the people? It will happen to you and through you in Jesus name name. Why don't you rise up and tell the Lord, oh Lord, here am I today. Here am I today. The reason you came to the Bible study is so that the practical profit of the Bible study and the practical anointing of the Bible study and the promises of the, of the Lord in the Bible study will be yours tonight. Take those two points by point and one by one and say, Lord, I'm here tonight. It will happen to me. Open your mouth and pray to the Lord. Don't be ignorant of the important thing the Lord has revealed unto us. He died to save us. He died to redeem us. He died to forgive our sins. He died so that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you are not saved yet, call on the name of the Lord. Salvation is available. If you have not had power, to overcome temptation and sin. Call on the name of the Lord. It's available. It's available. He died to get you saved. He died to make you live. And whosoever, that's you, whosoever, that's you, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. The Lord is waiting for you to call on his name. To turn away from your sin. To confess and forsake. And in his redemption will come to you. His salvation will come to you. His life eternal will come to you. The Jews were ignorant of the necessity of Christ's death. You are no more ignorant. You have heard over and over how he said he must die to take away your sin. Behold the Lamb of God who taketh away the sin of the whole world. Be a partaker tonight. Let his salvation be yours tonight.
believe that he died and for you in particular he died his blood cleanses us from all sin He forgives, he sets free, he breaks the power of cancel sin, he transforms us, he gives us the power to go and sin no more. I'll give you the assurance of salvation. The Spirit of God will be a witness in your heart that you are saved. Let him remove every form of ignorance concerning his death and his resurrection. Believe and it will give you eternal life. It will save your soul. It's not by feeling. You may not feel different. But once you believe that work of grace is done, your name is written in the book of life in heaven. And the Spirit of God will be a witness with your heart. You are a child of God. And He give you the grace to live a victorious triumphant conquering life sin will not have dominion over you anymore and then you serve the Lord in self forgetfulness forget yourself Be humble. Don't allow pride that ruined Satan to ruin your life. Pride is a great snare. Pride brings strife, brings violence. Pride brings the tendency to want to compete with Christ, want to compete with the Holy Ghost. You don't want people to be controlled by Christ alone. You want to take them away from the control of Christ and bring them under your own control as pride. You want to lord it over other people. That's pride. You want to be the master of their soul. That's competing with Christ. You want to be the master of members in the church. Not allowing Christ to lead them and teach them and guide them and counsel them. 
and make them do what they ought to do. Become faithful. Forget about wanting to have dominion over other people. Be a Christian. Seek not your own. And I'll be careful you are not stopping other people from doing what God has called them to do. Forbidding them. Remember the church? Don't do anything to forbid your minister, your pastor, your overseer. Either by remote control or by direct imposition. Don't give yourself freedom to do evil. Allow other people to have the freedom to do good. To be themselves. We saw someone casting out devils in your name. And we forbade him. Don't do that again. Don't forbid anyone. Let everyone serve the Lord with joy, with happiness, with conviction, with courage, with liberty. Don't forbid anyone. Don't crush anyone's spirit. Don't be envious. Don't be jealous. Don't be angry. That will be of the devil. Release other people from under your yoke. Forbid no one. Don't seek your own will over other people. Allow people of God to serve the Lord with joy. Allow the people of God to live a life of their conviction. Don't allow anyone to fear you more than they fear Christ, more than they fear God. Let's all serve the Lord with joy, with happiness. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of God. The house of God should be peaceful, joyful, happy, rewarding, fulfilling. That when we think of coming to the house of God, we're happy. We're not afraid. There's somebody there who might not want us to be happy. Might not want us to be free. You serve the Lord with joy and allow other people to serve the Lord without fear or joy. 